Nityandam, welcoming you to this live event, live question and answers. We're going to start the session. The Sadhguru Vandanam. Nityanandam Paramasukhadam Kevalam Yanamurtim Dvanvati Tam Gagana Sadarsham Tatvamasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalamachalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavati Tam Triguna Rahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Yes, so welcoming this live session. If you unclutch question and answers, if you have any questions, I would share, write it in the comments. I will share the powerful cognitions and clicks that Swamiji shared with all of us to bring more insight, more clarity, and to remove um, whatever we wish to free ourselves from in our life. Also doing some unclutching, so in between the questions, sit in the space of unclutching, not engaging with any thoughts, not creating any thoughts, not entertaining any thoughts, not destroying any thoughts, just being in the space of unclutching. Build the space of unclutching for yourself in your life. So that you can carry the space in whatever action you perform throughout the day. If you have any questions, write it in the comments. I'll read the question and share. I actually want to start with a question which I received on uh, YouTube actually. So the question was, yes, somebody was sharing they felt that life was hard and that I am so spiritual and do not hurt people yet all my life I suffer so much wanted to have some insights powerful cognitions regarding this so the first thing that I, I felt like sharing regarding this question was about this idea of I'm doing good to people. So the thing is that what I, what I, what Swamiji made me realize is that our standards to identify if we are doing good or uh, bad to people are not accurate. So sometimes we feel we are doing good because society has taught us that this is good, but uh, what society has taught us is not necessarily true. And that is why having a guru, an enlightened master, and even better, an avatar. Today we have Swamiji, a living incarnation of Paramashiva. So when you have an avatar, um, he guides you. He shows you what is real enriching, real not hurting others. So sometimes we feel, you know, being socially correct or being behaving in a certain way with people where people do not get triggered is uh, is not hurting people 
But that's not necessarily true. One thing that Swamiji made me realize is that sometimes, especially in the, in the relationship with friends you can see in your life, when you have a, a friend for a very long time, both of you get acquainted to each other so well that you know how much you can go without uh, provoking the other individual, your friend, the other person. So you guys will stay into a kind of a mutual, mutually agreed or accepted zone where you will cherish that friendship. But what Swamiji is showing us and inspiring us to do is to do completion. And to do completion to a level where there is no such thing as a comfort zone and beyond that zone things start to get a little fiery. In the space of completion, in the, in the space of completion, there is no more fire. So it's not about doing good to others. It's about doing what is the right thing to do at that specific uh, moment in time. And for that, you need to be in a very deep space of listening to know what should be done at that specific moment in time. So that is one thing. So sometimes on a superficial level, it looks like we're doing good things, but deep down, we are not responding to life in the way we should respond to life. Sometimes we are stuck in a pattern a life negative pattern which is bringing us to lower states of consciousness and we might not be aware of that so when you have that space of listening you become aware of that and when you become aware of that you attend to that space to that pattern and you help the individual to break the pattern so sometimes you have to be ferocious in some form to help the person to realize hey you think that something is okay in your life, but it's actually not okay. Deep down, you know it's not okay, but somehow you convince yourself that it is okay. So like that, uh, we need to really see deep down what is okay and what is not okay. And after that, you know, attending to what is not okay directly without trying to compensate by other things instead. So that's one thing regarding not hurting others that I wanted to share. The other thing is about suffering. Swamiji has initiated us into the tattoo of responsibility, responsibilism. Not responsibilism in the way that society teaches us, but responsibilism in the way that you are responsible for everything that happens inside you and you are responsible for everything that happens outside you. So we need to constantly contemplate on that to implement it in our life and to fully grasp the depth and the powerfulness of this tatwa. But when we suffer, the truth is, we are responsible for that suffering. And I can give a, a, a short example. If you put two individual, individuals in the same situation, they will most likely not experience the same thing. Swamiji was saying that Hinduism initiates its followers into this, the knowledge of subjective reality. There is the reality, there is the objective reality, and there is the subjective reality. And the subjective reality depends on you. So sometimes in one situation you will feel happy, and you put another person in the same situation and they will be bored or sad or depressed. So it's not, it's a subjective thing, meaning that we are, what, what clicked with me was like, we are entirely responsible for the experience we have inside of us. So you have to remember that. First, you have to remember that. Because if you feel that you're suffering, that's because you're deciding, I mean, it sounds very straightforward and perhaps blunt to say but Swamiji is like you are cherishing suffering you are creating suffering for yourself so you have to look in and see like why am I generating that experience within myself what is the cognition of life 
or about myself? What is the thought current? What is the logic from which I operate? Which makes me believe that I should feel like I'm suffering now. And you should break it. See, sometimes we carry things from in the bio memory from previous lives. And Swamiji was saying, actually, you don't even need to worry about previous lives because everything that you carry from previous lives would have manifested in some form in this life. So if you, manif if you, ha if you just manage this life, that is enough to clean your bio memory from everything. So we have to look in. Why do we feel that we need to suffer? What is, what, is the, what is the justification you have to justify you creating suffering within yourself? So of course it, it requires a little bit of unclutching. It requires a little bit of, you know, not engaging with your thoughts and whatever is happening inside of you. So you can distance yourself. These truths should not be, Swamiji says, that everything I teach should be cognized in a life positive way. So these truths sometimes can seem very harsh and a little bit insensitive, but we should not cognize them like that. We should, it's, it's, it is a truth not for to, to be insensitive to what you're experiencing or the reality that you experience, but for you to have the right uh, the right understanding to gauge and to evaluate your life and change your life. Because what the, the most amazing thing about the tattoo of responsibilism is that if you are responsible for everything which happens inside of you and everything which happens and affects and, if, and, and, and impacts your life in some form outside of you, then you can change it. Because it's you, it, it all depends on you. So it's all about bringing the powerfulness inside, within, in you. Not putting the power, for, the power outside and experiencing powerlessness. When we start to do that, we stop blaming things in life. So contemplating, living the tatua of responsibility, the cosmic principle of responsibility, will remove suffering. There's nothing else to do actually. Constantly living the tattoo of responsibilism, contemplating for the deeper meanings and the, the, the different aspects of the tattoo and living it. Whatever you cognize, whatever understanding you have of this principle, live it fully. And as you live it, you will have deeper and deeper understandings. And as these understandings comes, you will implement them. It's like, it's a virtuous circle. And then you realize that the more you do that, the more we realize that, yeah, we are responsible and we can do something about it because we are responsible. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's one of the most powerful principle that Swamiji taught, in my opinion. Um, it's, very, it's very expansive. It expands your inner space intensely and it brings you that deep uh, serenity, deep powerfulness, deep peacefulness within yourself, knowing that you are powerful. So that's what I, how I wanted to uh, respond to this question that I got on YouTube. So yes, so if you have any other question regarding this or other questions, whatever it may be, write it in the comments. I will read and share whatever cognitions Swamji uh, has shared and clicked with me of how to handle that situation or at least start to attend to that situation. Otherwise, you can spend a few minutes in the space of unclutching with me. Remembering Swamiji and not engaging with any thoughts, not creating, sustaining or trying to destroy any thoughts. Just being in the space of pure unclutching.
Yes. If I go do unclutching sessions, I get massive collective thought attacks for days. Even though I am someone who unclutch easily, do you know what causes this massive thoughts attacks after the sessions? Maybe if you want to, yes, expand a little bit on what you mean by massive thought attacks. if that's exactly what you meant but um, one thing I can share even for me initially because I got introduced into spirituality from the context of Buddhism uh, in the Buddhism which is taught in today's I mean mainly at least in uh, today's world we tend to separate the spiritual life I mean not only in Buddhism I mean in general as far as my experience goes people tend to separate the spiritual life with the uh, daily life. So what happens is when we do meditation, we seek a very uh, sp a specific environment that is favorable for meditation. And then what happens after that is that we can experience some kind of, ex of state, a different state of consciousness while we do meditation. But the moment we decide to end the meditation and we come back to the normal world then everything like it's like we get bombarded by everything which did not happen or we put aside it's like you put your day-to-day -day life outside the door you go do meditation and then when you go outside, when you finish your meditation and leave, you take everything back and go back into life. But one thing which, which I, I started to realize is that that's a problem you f we face when you separate spirituality and the normal life. Actually, Swamiji was saying that spirituality is not something separate it is it is a it is the inner space you create for yourself as you engage with life so there should not be any separation between um, the spiritual life and the normal life when you when you leave the meditation it's not like you're taking back everything and you go to attend to life with everything that you have it should be it should be a state where we start to cherish and we start to implement it in our daily life. When we do unclutching, actually unclutching never ends. It just we decide when we decide to we decide to clutch back uh, most of the time unconsciously because of various patterns. And when we clutch, we forget about unclutching, and at some point we remember about unclutching and we unclutch. But that the, when, the more and more you do unclutching, the more and more you build the space of unclutching for yourself by just deciding to unclutch, whether it is in a controlled environment, in a uh, favorable environment or not. But when you constantly decide to unclutch, at some point, you are able to act, be active, fully engaged, passionately engage with life while remaining, remaining in the same um, in the same space of unclutching and that's where uh, these situations of massive thought attacks would uh, would never it would never happen because at some point that's why constantly remembering and reminding ourselves to be in the space of unclutching is important uh,
Yes, I really get massive attacks. It's like collect collective thoughts. Just regarding this collective thoughts, I mean, sometimes, um, I don't know if you're referring to when you go outside, you feel the vibrations of people and the thoughts of people, and that is impacting you in a certain way. Um, in these situations, I, I, I would really feel like connecting with Swamiji. Just in the Guru Disciple tradition, we say you hold, to the, hold on to the feet of Swamiji. You just hold on. Whatever happens, you cognize it, okay, but you have a conscious decision. I'm holding on to Swamiji's feet. That's all. And if you constantly cherish this powerful cognition, you will, you will, the, uh, I mean, things will be happening around you, but you will totally, you'll be in a completely different space. So you will not experience any of the effects of all the, of, of that. So, yeah, especially sometimes, you know, because of the life we live, we are forced to be around many people. And sometimes the vibrations of the people around us are not, uh, not always the best. So we, it impacts us in various ways. And sometimes we are more sensitive to it uh, than other people. So in these situations, I would, re like, I, I would really feel simplest ways, really just remembering Guru's feet and holding on to the Guru's feet invoking his grace his blessings his space of completion just remembering basically smaranat mukti remembrance liberates yes that's the best way Swamiji says, simple attachment to the Guru. Simple attachment to the Guru is very simple. You just love. When you love, you go into a different space. It's a totally different game. It's like, it's not like Swamiji says, right? When you, when the, when suddenly you fall in love, suddenly the trees are more green, the air is more breezy and everything because it's like a different space. So that, that really, that just, you just shift out and you are no longer affected by lower frequency thoughts or emotions or vibrations. That is why, uh, yeah, that is, that is the grace of the Guru, so important to have Guru. That is why Hinduism is so much focused on Guru-disciple relationship or Guru having devotee, uh, Guru-devotee relationship because if you cherish simple attachment to Guru, literally, all the problems of your life can disappear because when you simply when you simply share when you simply have simple attachment to the guru and simple love towards the guru the heart chakra expands so much the love energy oozes out and when the love energy oozes out it's like a flood like nothing can stop it you can't do anything even if there's terrible things around you suddenly everything becomes auspicious because that is the nature of the love energy. That is the nature of that chakra. So holding on to the feet of the Guru, having simple attachment, simple love, puppy love, Swamiji says, puppy love with the Guru is a, is a way to, to completely... See, Swamiji was saying, Shiva is, has the power to transform anything negative into something positive. He can take something completely useless and make it so useful. That possibility gets awakened. So same way, with when you have love for Guru, the capacity to just transform negative energy into something auspicious simply starts to, it, be, it starts to manifest through you. It just starts to manifest. So holding on to Guru's feet, remembering Guru, cherishing simple attachment to Guru, his words and the experiences, or just remembrance, very powerful very powerful yeah we have another question regarding attachment for external love validation or attention it's 
Swamiji, when I when I, I can, first thing that I can see is that Swamiji, if we listen to how Swamiji related to his gurus, especially Arunagiri Yogeshwara, Guru is the most auspicious thing. Before we get um, the experience of liberation, before we have the the complete breakthrough or the, the cognitive shift, the, f the complete cognitive shift and realize uh, the space of Paramashivoham and make that as an experience, a continuous experience for ourselves, we will have this attention need, this bound to be. That's the heart chakra again. When the heart chakra is, is closed, uh, attention need happens. When the, the heart chakra is fully open, you become compassionate, you ooze. Love is oozing out of you. Again, a little similar to the previous question also. Love just oozes out of you. So it's all about... Um, in the, in the guru-disciple relationship, it's actually very simple. If you seek attention, if you have any form of attention need left in you, seek the attention of Guru. And how you do that? You are, you be integrated to what Guru says, the Guru Vak. When you're integrated, Guru, you will get the attention of Guru. So, and through this, because the Guru is a space of pure completion, it is Paramashiva. And Swamiji, it's Paramashiva directly. So because of that, when he gushes towards you, he gives you 10 million times more things than you can, that you're expecting. So like that, all incompletions become irrelevant. So again, remembering Guru, cherishing simple attachment to Guru, loving Guru, living Guru's words, Swamiji was giving a process recently um, how to build a very loving relationship and it was with the, the Atmalinga. So for those of you who got initiated into the Shiva, Shiva Diksha, you have your Atmalinga and he says, everything you do during the day, before you do it for yourself, do it for the Atmalinga. So when Swamiji shared that, what clicked with me was like, the first cognition should be for others. In this situation, it will be for Linga. So Swamiji was saying that to get out of selfishness, uh, you just need to start to live for others. Living for others is one of the, the, the things which Swamiji constantly uh, enriches us with. And it's like causing others reality, living for others. So everything that you do before attending to the need of the body and just attend to somebody else, to a need which is outside of you. So ob obviously the Linga Paramashiva does not need anything, but he will receive. So like that, you put your awareness, even as for me, the first time I started to experience that intensely was um, invoking the presence of Swamiji and Paramashiva before consuming food, solid food. I would sit and, and right away I would start to have this experience in the forehead and it just feels so... There's a presence, a very soothing, warm, pleasant, fulfilling presence, which is experienced. And in that presence, I would just start to just declare, no, I am Paramashiva, I am consciousness. This food is being consumed to maintain the body, but I am much more than just a body. Surely I have a body, but I am more than that. I am pure consciousness. I would remember powerful cognitions. And then from that experience and context, after setting the context, remembering that I am consciousness and that even though I fulfill the needs of the body, uh, I know that I'm not bound by the body because I am much more than just a body. And after that, you consume food, your space will be totally different. So, always going out towards Paramashiva, towards Guru.
that removes that that heals all love validation external attention desires that we have because the thing is that unless you have an enlightened master or even if you're lucky or an avatar which we have in today's in now Swamiji another person who is not in the space of complete completion actually they will never be able to fulfill you because they are not in the space of listening to cause your reality because they're still we the, unless you're in complete completion there is still a part of you which is cherishing selfish desires that selfishness will not allow you to be in the space of listening and really grasp what the person in front of you is seeking and giving that to the person so the person will never be able to give you exactly what you want and that's why it's like a, an endless circle where you always need more validation more attention more love because you never receive the love that you need you receive some form of love but that's not the love that you seek only when you receive the love that you seek only then your thirst for love vanishes the completion happens so only guru enlightened master or avatar will be in the space of listening to give you the love that you need and the moment he gives you the love that you need your heart chakra opens up and your attention need and love is no longer there it's completed Swamiji was sharing that see they're all like in the process of completion Swamiji shares that the emotions we have a lot of unfulfilled emotions inside of us emotions that we did not live fully so there's a hangover that gets stored in our muscle memory and our bio memory and seeks to get fulfilled but because of the various thought currents and blockages and everything it never happens so it just sits there and creates internal pressure and we get stuck but when you have that opening that pure love that the guru shares that is exactly customized for you and that is the most miraculous thing about about Paramashiva, about Guru, about Swamiji is that it is customized for each one of us and to fulfill the need that we seek as a being who seeks completion so when that happens everything all these memories these emotions these hangovers they just they get burnt and that is why actually that's one thing also Swamiji was sharing and even other other incarnations and masters before him uh, I can remember also Ramakrishna Paramamsa. He was sharing that that's why the path of devotion is the sweetest path to enlightenment. It is the easiest and sweetest path. Because when you have devotion and love, that love energy burn is so strong, it burns everything else. But in the process of burning everything else, you are in, in romance. So you don't experience the pain or the suffering. Because Swamiji was saying, there's two paths to be liberated. Intense suffering or intense love. Bhakti or tapas. Uh, of course, Swamiji, uh, recently he shared a satsang where he said that his gurus uh, loved him so much that they did tapas through his body. So he was able to do tapas without experiencing the pain. And, 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 the, and, the love, and he was just in the space of love and experiencing the benefit of the tapas. But, but basically, that's what it is. The love energy is so powerful. So powerful. It brings you to such a different space that in the, when the karmas get burnt, when the hangovers get burnt, you don't experience the burning. Because what happens is that sometimes when the burning happens and we don't have that bhakti, that love is not strong enough, then it becomes unpleasant and we stop the burning. And then we are still again stuck with some hangovers but when you cherish simple attachment love bhakti towards guru guru bhakti that is simplest way that is the simplest way it's very powerful since few months i don't eat or drink until swamiji has drank it 
but sometimes in the morning I will drink prasadam water or coffee. If there is no prasadam in the house, I will wait until he drinks and eats, then I will eat the prasadam. But the cognition you just mentioned is eye-opening. Yes, that's great. Even when we get initiated, initiated into Shiva Diksha and we receive the Atmalinga, I had a very strong experience because in the Agamas they say you should not consume food before doing Shiva Puja. So the Shiva Puja should be performed in the early morning during the Brahma Murta and only when Shiva Puja is completed then you can start to attend to the needs of the body. So the click I had was it is, so, it is so important to remember the ultimate before remembering you. Until you and the ultimate are in pure oneness. But then at that moment there is no more suffering, so there is no more questions. <laughs> but until there are questions or suffering, you should remember the ultimate before remembering you. So offer to Guru, offer to Paramashiva, to Shivalinga. And after that you can start to attend to your needs. It's not like you need to deprive yourself and stop. You can attend to yourself, but first attend to the ultimate. Attend to Paramashiva, attend to Guru. So for me, obviously I was not born in a Hindu environment, so this, um, this whole lifestyle of ritual, offering to deities, deity worship, prasadam, I never grew up with this uh, as a thought current or as a cognition. So when I discovered, when Swamiji uh, initiated me into all this and I started discovering it um, it's such a powerful process it's such a powerful process and I realized how important it was to relate to deities or even to the Shivalinga or even to the Guru Murti the, uh, the form of the Guru because as long as you are cognizing yourself in a form you have to cognize the ultimate in a form. When you are able to detach yourself from the form, then you don't need to worry about, you can worship the Swamiji said in one satsang, if you no longer attach yourself to the form, then you can worship Paramashiva in the form of formlessness, no problem. And he says, if you can stop eating and stop sleeping, stop attending to the needs of the body, then you can worship Paramashiva as formless so you don't need to have deity you don't need to do puja all that he was saying that but obviously that's not our situation going beyond the food uh, the consuming food pattern and the sleep pattern is a very big pattern that has been cherished for many lives um, again yesterday i was sharing even if you look at animals right because it, it starts to really build up in the animal body in the and in the animal body i mean I was, I was watching outside of where I am now and you can see squirrels and there's some wild rabbits here and there and they eat whole day, all day. It's like, that's all they're doing. Seeking food, consuming food, resting. Seeking food, consuming food, resting. So the sleeping pattern and the food pattern is such a deep pattern to drop. So... Uh, it's like, so it's so so. Then again, that's why. Then I realized, my God, the rishis and Paramashiva when he he gave the science of deity worship, is such a brilliant science. And then I also realized that it's impossible to experience the complete the complete completion, or Paramashiva in its completeness, or Guru in its completeness, um, if you do not engage with the form. Because initially when I started my journey, I was more into meditation and formlessness. The, that form, worshipping the form dimension was not something I was uh, acquainted to. But Swamiji gave me that understanding and gave the experience also. As I started to do puja on a daily basis and not consuming food before doing Shiva puja and doing uh, prayers invoking Paramashiva and Guru before consuming food, all these things are very powerful processes to give you completion with your body, with your form and help you raise beyond the patterns of food and sleep and everything related to that. 
because with the food pattern there's the hunger pattern with the sleep pattern there's the lust pattern so all these patterns are intertwined so when you start to attend to one of them they all start to collapse and it changes our life completely I was purely doing it because I cognized him as a member of my family. Now it's got huge click, it's about serving others also. Yes, Tomji always says life is for others. Life is for others. See, if you serve Swamiji, you are serving Swamiji. But if you look at how, what Swamiji is doing, everything that Swamiji is doing is for others. So by serving Swamiji, you serve others because everything that Swamiji does is serving others. So it's like, if you, you don't serve others directly, you serve Guru and through Guru you serve others because Guru is serving others. So it's, it's the same thing. But it's actually safer. I, I would feel the, the cognition I have is it's much safer to serve Guru than to serve others initially. Because when you serve others, they will have the, the possibility of having some incompletion reflection which we will not know how to handle. But in the relationship with Guru is a pure relationship. There is no incompletion coming from him. Incompletions can only come from us. So it's the safest relationship. Uh, other relationships can be, are risky because at any moment the individual in front of you can engage with you from an incompletion and if you don't see it coming then you get caught in it and, and then you also get incomplete. So that's why Guru-Disciple relationship is the safest, safest way for enlightenment. Even recently, Swamji said, and I shared on my Facebook wall also, um, two slokas which Swamji shared in the satsang. And they were basically saying that initiation is everything. You meet Guru, Guru initiates you. The moment you're initiated, you are declared as a Jivan Mukta. You, everything you need to achieve in this life, you have achieved it. And one of the slokas even says that if you don't receive initiation, even the path towards enlightenment is not possible. So it's like very deep. And how it clicked with me was that Swamji was saying humans have to receive the gift of enlightenment. When we are stuck in ego, in the powerlessness of ego, we want to do everything on our own, our own way, as per whatever karmas and bio memory we carry. And that's why we get stuck and we continuously suffer. But when Guru gives, you have to receive. Ego, ego does not want to receive. Ego wants to prove. So you have to drop the ego. When Guru gives, you have an opportunity to drop the ego and receive. When you drop, when you receive, you stop trying to prove. When you stop trying to prove, the ego is dismantled, disappears. So that is why that how I click was like initiation is ultimate. Because you need to be in a situation where you have to receive. You cannot get it. You have to receive it. You have to accept it. So it's very powerful. And then after that, you can simply live in the grace and bliss and powerfulness that the Guru-Disciple relationship creates. Yes, some animals sleep 22 hours. Swamiji always says, if you enjoy sleeping, in the next life you'll take body, the, the body of a buffalo. Because buffaloes sleep, I don't know, I guess maybe, maybe they're the ones sleeping 22 hours. So, it's like sleeping pattern is a big, uh, is a big thing. Yeah, yeah. How I, one, one click I got with, with the sleeping is like, I was, I was really contemplating on like, why do we enjoy sleeping? Why do, why, why is it, why is sleeping such a big deal for humans? And... And, and uh, one of the clicks that I got was like, when you sleep, you forget your life. You become unconscious of your life. So one of the click I got is like, when you are not aligned to your being, when you're not in the space of complete completion, deep down, you don't enjoy your life. That is why you want to withdraw in the sleep state. But when you live in complete completion, you enjoy your life. So the decision to withdraw never makes sense for you because you just want more. When you enjoy something, you always want more. In the same way, when you enjoy your life, you want more life. You don't want to sleep and forget everything. No, I want more. So the, that's, that's the click I got. And that is why masters, you know, they never sleep. 
even if they rest because the body needs to recuperate to a certain level, maybe two hours, one or two hours a day, they never become unconscious. That's what Sanji says, it's Samadhi. Go into a different state where they are in the pure consciousness. They're not asleep, unaware and forgetting everything. Because they are in Swamiji's name, Nityananda, eternal bliss. And when you are in eternal bliss, you never want to withdraw from life. Yeah, children, they don't want to sleep. Because the body is growing intensely, there's an intense mutation happening in the body of a child. That drains a lot of energy. For that, they sleep. But otherwise, they never want to sleep because they're so alive, so active. They, they want to discover everything. They don't have patterns. The patterns are not frozen yet. So they're like full of life. That, I, and that reminds me of a, of a situation where they, they, some scientists did an experiment with hockey players. They took some hockey players which are technically highly fit athlete, athletes because they do so much training and it's a very stamina requiring sport playing hockey. And uh, they put these, uh, these hockey players in the, in the kindergarten with children and they were responsible to you know, keep up with the child for a certain amount of time and each hockey player failed. They couldn't keep up with the child because it's not about fitness, it's about completion. It's not about how endurant your body is, it's about how complete you are about the way you exist. When you are complete, you don't experience stress, you don't experience st strain, you don't feel strained. So you never get tired. So that's like, that's, that's why it's so important. It's about completion. It's about completion. Yes. And that is why Sanatana Hindu Dharma was so powerful because the Gurukul system. The Gurukul system is when the child is young in that space that we are sharing about. The child is so receptive to life. He's fully open to life. He doesn't have any incompletions or anger or everything about life. He's fully open to life. Now, okay, it depends on various things, but in general, He's very open to life and at that time if the child is taught the right cognitions his life becomes a blessing but if you're not taught the right cognitions then you develop incompletions and then your whole life you struggle because you're constantly experiencing some powerlessness and some conflicts inside your inner space that is why after that you need you know, intense completion and everything. So that's why Sanatana and Dharma was so powerful because it was all about guru-disciple relationship and gurukul, children uh, growing in the space around the guru. So the beings, the amount of completion the beings were having was so high, so high. So naturally, the society was totally different. It was a, such a healthy and powerful society, life positive society. Swamiji was saying that Bharat, the Hinduism at the beginning when it got, when it got manifested, they, they, they never worried about their survival. In one satsang, I remember in Varanasi, he was sharing that because the Bharat was surrounded by the Himalayas on one side and three oceans on the other side, there, the, this concept of invasion never happened. They were never, they were almost, they were maybe 5%, but they basically never had the fear of being invaded. So when you don't have the fear of invasion, you don't have, you don't feel the survival need, the threat for your life. So all your lifetime and energy gets infused into life positive and going towards the divine realizing the space of Paramashivoham within yourself. And so that's how this amazing tradition manifested from that space. And the fundamental roots of this tradition is Guru-Disciple relationship and Gurukul. And Goshalas, taking care of cows, but that's a different thing.
yes when we start to yeah when you start to teach children in gurukul you realize that like oh my god such a blessing it would it would have been if i had these cognitions when i was a child of course anybody who realizes the powerfulness of these cognitions naturally would have wished that they had that as a child yeah it's a big blessing a big blessing to have Swamiji in, in your life when you're so young yes when we do unclutching unclutch for everything even visions you see it happening and and it disappears it disappears do not feel like oh no i want to in I, I want to engage with this vision more and more i want this to continue just if it is there it is there watch it come watch it go and clutching is is all about swamiji says unclutching should happen see when you do the unclutching meditation you should constantly remember, I have to un unclutching, unclutching, unclutching. Swamji says the complete unclutching happens when even the remembrance of unclutching no longer happens. So unclutching is to that depth. Intense unclutching. So you should hold on to one thing throughout the process, which is unclutching, unclutching, unclutching. And even that the unclutching should be so powerful that even that gets dispelled, removed, disappears. That is pure oneness. And the more we practice unclutching, the more we carry the space of unclutching in our life, in our day-to-day -day actions, we are less reactive. Recently, Swamji talks about reactionary assumptions. You know, something happens and right away we come to our own conclusions and respond to life and act right away. It says, no, don't have reactionary assumptions. If it is a conscious decision, okay. But if it's just an impulse, a reaction, then that is not unclutching. And most of the time, we all the mess-ups we do in our lives are because of these actions, spontaneous uh, not spontaneous, but uh, these uh, assumptions, these reactionary assumptions. Because in reactionary assumptions, it is the pattern which is operating, not the conscious decision. So we should always be in a space of unclutching, see what is there, make a conscious decision, and engage. So always conscious decision, conscious decision. When you constantly make conscious decisions, you manifest your life consciously. When we forget, to make conscious decisions, our pattern create our life. So it's a, con a constant remembrance. That's why we always have reminders of Guru, of Swamiji around us. Because when we see when we see his form, even here having Paramashiva, Parashakti, Manon Mani. And Swamiji in the poster is just a reminder. Oh yes, Swamiji is space of pure completion. Swamiji is space of pure unclutching. I love Swamiji. All these automatically get remembered. So these these remembrance they destroy the life negative thoughts and emotions and everything we have inside of us. And it makes our life fulfilled, coming back to a space of pure. Completion. Sometimes people think that it's an obsession. They don't understand why in the in Hinduism we always have gods and goddesses and guru pictures of gurus and forms of gurus and forms of gods and goddesses everywhere. They think it's an obsession or something. They don't understand. No, it is not an obsession. It is remembrance. Because when you realize the power of forgetfulness, you remember. You realize the importance of remembrance. Dakshinamurti, Paramashiva in the form of Dakshinamurti, he has his right foot on a small dwarf, a demon dwarf. 
and that dwarf is the apasmara, apasmasura. So it is the demon of forgetfulness. Forgetfulness is the most powerful demon which is there. And the only way to destroy this demon is to remember Guru, to remember Paramashiva. Remembrance destroys forgetfulness. So that is why so many, in so many ways, remember even wearing Rudrakshas to remember Paramashiva, the medallion of Swamiji to remember Guru, the Rud here also Kantamala, even wearing the Basma, the Kumkum, the orange cloth, it's all remembrance, remember. Remember, remember your conscious decision to align to complete completion. Remember your conscious decision to align to Swamiji. Remember the Guru Vax, the instructions of Guru. Remember the cosmic principles shared by Guru. It's remembrance, remembrance, remembrance. And through remembrance, liberation is achieved. Smaranat Mukti, remembrance liberates. Yeah, that's why, forgetfulness. We say we're gonna do something and we do it for a certain amount of time and before we know, oh, I forgot. But then Swamiji says, that's not a problem. If you don't give up, you should not give up. The moment you realize you forgot, you should engage with it again. You should not feel guilty or drop the whole thing because you forgot. Okay, you forgot, forgot, and forget that you forgot and just do it again, <laughs> continue again. So, that's important. We should not be um, having uh, fanatic conclusions. Oh, I was supposed to do, I did not do, okay, this is failure, so I'm just dropping the whole thing. No, should not entertain these thought currents. If you forgot, you forgot. Now you remember, so engage with it again and continue, continue. Will persistence, that develops the will persistence. Will persistence makes us manifest Paramashiva, makes us manifest the powers of Paramashiva. Makes us manifest oneness with Swamiji, with Guru. I feel that in today's world, we have a lot of fanatic conclusions. You know, if, if I cannot do it perfectly, then I might as well not do it. This kind of ideas. But that doesn't work in life. It works only in the thought level, mental level, fantasy level. But in life, it doesn't work. In life, you have to do the will persistence until you manifest the reality you want for yourself. Another important point is the quantum entanglement. When you constantly see pictures of Swamiji or Murtis or uh, deities of gods and goddesses and all that, you, you entangle, the feeling connection happens. And when the feeling connection happens, it doesn't matter where the Guru is, how far or how close he is from you, it doesn't matter where the god and goddesses is. When you, when you remember, that quantum entanglement happens, the mirroring of neurons happens and you start living that. <laughs> 